Wow! Today we are going on a butterfly hunt. We are looking for one rare and special species. Not just that. We are visiting the Mayendel Natural Reserve. A protected natural reserve in the dunes in my country, the Netherlands. But not before I show you The Hague. A famous city in the Netherlands. That's right. Butterflies, nature and a travel vlog combined. Let's get started! Hello everyone, this is Bart Coppens. And today I am holding an encyclopedia of the butterfly species of the Netherlands. And today I am going to tell you a story about a special butterfly. This is a butterfly species for my country that I have always wanted to see in the wild. It is Agrinus papia or the silver washed fritillary. Now this butterfly used to be a little bit common in my country, in the dunes, but from 1980 and beyond the species has more or less vanished from my country. And since then they've only had very sporadic breeding populations which sometimes extinguish themselves. There's also been many years in which none of these butterflies have been spotted in the Netherlands only for them to recolonize some areas temporarily. This is a rare and threatened species in my country and they are definitely struggling in this part of Europe. I know that Agrinus papia is perhaps a common species in southern Europe and around the Mediterranean but for me and in my country it is a rarity. So I always wanted to see this species in the wild. But what prevented me from doing so? Well, first of all it's the fact that um, they are quite rare, so sometimes we don't know where to look. But since recently I've had a report that the butterflies are back and they are breeding in a natural reserve called Mayendel Natural Reserve. Despite me having this information, it was never possible for me to go there and make a video. Why? It is far away from my home and I cannot really afford to travel half the country just to make one video of a butterfly. It's too far away from where I live. It's near the ocean at the dunes and I am more in the middle of the country. But something has changed which has enabled me to travel. What that is, I'll tell you later. But today we are going on a butterfly hunt for the silver washed fritillary, Agrinus papia. And I booked a hotel in the city of The Hague, the Netherlands, just so I can sleep there and get up early in the morning to get into the natural reserve where this species has been reported breeding. Let's go.
Wait, what the hell is going on? What the heck is this place? Where am I? Let me explain, ladies and gentlemen. I booked a hotel room because this video requires me to film far away from home. I'm going to make a video in a nature reserve in the dunes in the Netherlands near the ocean. And the problem is the ocean is kind of far away from my house. I cannot go to the dunes, make a video and then back to my home in one day. I need a place to sleep. And that's where this hotel room comes in. Special video time. Right now I'm in The Hague, the Netherlands. And let me tell you something guys. This room was paid for me by a fan. That's right. This hotel room, the cost, the price, the money I had to pay for this hotel room was paid for me by a fan. And we know his name once again. It's Rob. Thank you so much, Rob. You are a super fan of my channel and my hair looks terrible again. So um, tomorrow, after I sleep in this hotel room, God, what's going on? This thing has a life of its own. Tomorrow, after I sleep in this hotel room, I will wake up. I will immediately go into the natural reserve as early as I can, when the sun is rising, after I had some breakfast. And um, when I arrive there, I'm going to look for special kinds of butterflies. Hopefully we will find them, but any other wildlife as well. So that's gonna be exciting. So I rarely travel for the sole purpose of making a video, but today is an exception. And this, this uh, room is also interesting because the hotel I booked is a hotel that's also used by international students. That's why my hotel room kind of looks like a dorm room. Do you see that? I even have here a desk and uh, a board and stuff like that. And sometimes international students who visit the Netherlands, they book these, these rooms for months and months on end. That's kind of funny, don't you think? It's called the Student Hotel. Oop. It's called the Student Hotel in The Hague, Den Haag. But here's the thing, you don't have to be a student to book it. You, they also accept random hobos like me, because they have a lot of rooms and hey, they want to make money on the, hiring these rooms to people. So it's also a hotel slash student uh, dormitory, I suppose. Very unique, it's a good budget option. So, um, ah, let's get started tomorrow, but first I think I'm going to explore the city of The Hague. Yeah, let's close the door, otherwise you can see my toilet. Don't worry, I haven't used it yet. <laughs> but tonight, no, just kidding. Let, let's, not, let's not be weird right now. Let's go. So yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and whine into the camera all day. I'm gonna pack my stuff. Still haven't eaten yet, I'm starving. Gotta get some food after a day of traveling. Got my GoPro here, it's gonna help us make some nice footage. Oh, and for the people who are not interested in all this travel stuff, I also make a short version of this video that only shows the nature part. We can leave this here, this is, uh, oh, haha. <laughs> a clean underpants for tomorrow. That's gonna be useful. What if I piss myself? No, let's, let's get started. Now people, here's something that I rarely show you. And that's how ridiculous I look as a YouTuber. This thing on my head is my GoPro. See that? And on my shoulders, I'm often carrying like a tripod that's several kilos heavy. So I'm, as a YouTuber, I'm often literally just completely packed with gear like this and I look ridiculous walking around in public. But yeah, if you ever see a guy who looks absolutely stupid and has cameras strapped to his head, then there's a chance you've seen Bart Coppens. Oh yes, oh fuck yes, that's right. Oh yes, that's him, Bart Coppens. The myth, the man, the legend, let's go. Hope you guys have the good perspective here. 
Let me adjust it a little bit. There you go. Have some impressions of Den Haag or The Hague as you call it in English. Personally, I rarely come here, but over 550,000 people live here. And this city is somewhat close to the North Sea. It is the third largest city in my country, the Netherlands, after Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Not just that. The Hague is the city that our government operates from. The Hague is home to many different international judicial bodies, such as the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court and more. That's why you hear about this city on the news sometimes. People who commit war crimes or terrorism are prosecuted here sometimes internationally. Den Haag or The Hague, you may have heard of it before. It is known for international law and justice. This is where war criminals are often convicted. Its history also dates back to the 13th century. That's a lot of history. It's an old city. I rarely come here because it's far away from my home. But I guess why not? Today uh, I mainly come here to show you nature, uh, the dunes tomorrow. It's too far away from my home, so I needed a place to sleep. And I choose the Hague, which is proximity to the ocean and the dunes. It's a coastal city close to the North Sea. Bit of facts and information of me. Why not? Departement van Justitie, guys. Can you read what that means? It means Department of Justice. Dutch and English are very similar. And here is our government building, I suppose. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're ever in the Netherlands, this behind me is a very important place. This is more or less our parliament building in The Hague, Den Haag. And this is where our government operates. All our most prominent politicians are working in here. This is our government building. The Hague is basically to the Netherlands, but Washington is to the United States, I suppose. Because this thing here behind me is where all the important decisions are being made by our government. Now, I never expected my channel to have a travel vlog. It's mostly about nature and insects. But if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And hey, if, if a fan sends me to The Hague, I'm going to show you something about the city as well.
I can't say I've ever been very passionate about politics, but you know what? If you give me an office like this, maybe I will change my mind as well. So now I'm going to uh, what is for Dutch people a very famous little place. The Binnenhof. Every Dutch person knows what it is. But this is basically where our uh, ministry operates. And uh, some of our most prominent politicians, you can see them in this little area when we enter it. Let's go. I know this video is about butterflies, but let me give you a lesson about my country. The Binnenhof is a complex of buildings in the city center of The Hague, the Netherlands, next to the Hof Vijver. It houses the meeting place of both houses of the State General of the Netherlands, as well as the Ministry of General Affairs and the office of the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Built primarily in the 13th century, the Gothic castle originally functioned as a residence of the Counts of Holland and became the political center of the Dutch Republic as early as 1584. It is counted among the top 100 Dutch heritage sites. The Binnenhof is among the oldest parliament buildings in the world, still in use. Our most prominent politicians work here in this building, including the Prime Minister. If you're super lucky, you can even spot him here. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, but this is where all the decisions in the Netherlands are being made by our government. Cool, huh? This little area here is very famous among Dutch people. It's known as the Binnenhof. And if you're here during the day, you can see a few prominent politicians, if you're lucky, to just go to work like any other person. In fact, the prime minister during the day is seen here pretty often. I just thought it was interesting to show you. The fountain at the Binnenhof, in honor of Count William II of Holland. The fountain was donated in 1858 by the citizens of The Hague on the occasion of a major overhaul of the Binnenhof complex. The Ridderzaal. And this building dates back from the 13th century. It is used for the annual state opening of Parliament on a special day named Prince's Day or Prinsjesdag, when the Dutch monarch drives to the Parliament in the golden coach and delivers the speech from the throne. It is also used for official royal receptions and inter-parliamentary conferences. Over the centuries, the government buildings developed around this building, named the Ridderzaal. This video is a butterfly hunt. But it's a special video and I'm trying to make it as entertaining and rich in content as possible. And when I see interesting things along the way, I will share with you some details to my viewers, including our parliament building. In front of the building are canals and a huge pond, more or less a mini lake, that contains some interesting stuff as well. And perhaps it also helps you learn a little bit about my country, the Netherlands. 
Some interesting stuff I saw were these huge fish for example. They look like carp, but the sun was going down and the low light conditions made it difficult to capture them on camera against the dark waters. I also saw what looks like wild bass. One thing you probably do not expect to see in the Netherlands are parrots, but you are wrong. In those trees behind me are an invasive species of parrot, or more or less a parakeet, that have taken over the Netherlands. Here, let me show you a closer. Meet the ring-necked parakeet, Herpsitacula grameri. As a popular pet species, Escaped birds have colonized a number of cities around the world, including northern and western Europe. These parakeets have also proven themselves capable of living in a variety of climates outside of their native range and are able to survive low winter temperatures in northern Europe. Since the 19th century, the rose ringed parakeet or the ring necked parakeet has successfully colonized many other countries. It breeds further north than any other parrot species and it has established itself on a large scale in Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy and especially the United Kingdom. Where introduced Rose neck ring parakeets or ring neck parakeets may affect native biodiversity and human economy wellness. As colorful and beautiful and intelligent as these birds are, like any invasive species, they can threaten native wildlife. Studies have shown that they compete directly with a number of native bird species. For example, studies have shown that these parrots compete for nesting cavities with native birds, which makes native species unable to find a safe place to build a nest. Birds such as nuthatches, woodpeckers and several species of owls are said to decline in areas where ringneck parakeets dominate the landscape. Yep, these birds are ring neck parakeets. Originally they are native to countries like India and Pakistan until a few irresponsible pet owners released them. Turns out they are able to survive in the cities in the Netherlands pretty well and are forming huge colonies, even next to our parliament buildings. While this sounds like bad news for wild birds in my country, there is also good news. It turns out that the distribution of these species is mainly limited to cities and suburbs in the Netherlands. This is perhaps because in cities there is a constant abundance of food. These birds mainly eat seeds, berries, nuts, fruits and interestingly also flowers. However, several studies have shown that these birds struggle to find enough food in winter in northern Europe. In the wild, these birds would essentially starve here in winter. However, in cities they raid bird feeders or take food from gardens. In fact, it's probably bird feeders alone that sustains most of them in winter. If people stopped feeding the birds in winter, they would have even less chance of surviving here in winter. So I guess the good news is there is very little risk of this bird becoming invasive in the natural environment of the Netherlands and their spread will probably be contained to cities in the near future. This is why you never release any pets people. Parrots are nice but these birds can actually threaten the local birds by stealing their nesting cavities and outcompeting them. Wow. Huge numbers of parakeets.
Don't be mistaken, people. These are a somewhat harmful invasive species in my country. The good news is they struggle to survive outside of cities because they need the warm microclimate of cities to survive in, so they cannot spread to the countryside much yet. But let's hope that never happens, that would be a problem. All right, people, it's slowly getting dark. Tomorrow I have to get up early to look for butterflies. So slowly I'm gonna go head back to my hotel room. This is the elevator.
God said, lottery light. Oh, wow. Oh, my. Oof. It's hard to believe this video is about butterflies and moths and nature, but it's going to be. All of this is just some extra stuff. You see, because one of my fans paid for this video, so I'm going to try everything in my power to make it extra fun. It includes showing you the city, telling you something about politics, showing you our parliament building, uh, showing you the, the Hague or Den Haag, as we Dutch people call it. It's all part of the game. See, finding butterflies and moths also involves careful planning and traveling. Now, for those of you who are not a fan of travel videos, I have good news. I will be making a short summary of my video in the dunes in the Netherlands and the rare butterflies I will hopefully see there. Um, and it will not include the traveling part for those of you who don't want to see this kind of stuff. But there are some viewers who like it. Let me know in the comments, do you like it or not? Anyway, I bought some more stuff. I went to the supermarket. And here I have some very typical Dutch snacks. Why? Well, that's because people on my channel always like it when I talk about Dutch snacks. I guess my country, the Netherlands, is not one that gets a lot of attention online. So I will show you some stuff. I've also brought a few random beers and some nuts. And um, I have three beers. That's my limit because uh, I have to get up uh, tomorrow morning very early, so I'm a 28 year old man, if I drink too much I'm gonna be fucked up tomorrow, that's not what we want. We can just taste test some beers for fun and relax in our hotel room. Just pretend this is a friendship simulator, okay? <laughs> Isn't that what YouTube is? <sighs> We're gonna catch a few shower too, maybe tonight. Cheers! Um, I have a problem. I need beer, but... I don't have a freaking bottle opener, so I can hope I can use the key of my house. God damn it. Oh, this is a bummer. Now I need to find a creative way to open it without killing myself. Being a YouTuber is a difficult job, ladies and gentlemen, because I just did hours of walking for the sole purpose of making a video and my hair is so terrible! My hair is so terrible! <laughs> anyway, I figured I need a beer, but I don't have an opener. <laughs> How am I gonna do this? Well, my acting skills are getting scary, see that? <laughs> see? Oh my god. Be careful, you never know what emotions I'm really feeling. So, um, oh man, this is so, like, why do beers even have these traditional bottle caps, man? Why can't we just have, like, a can, I don't know, one that we can twist with our hands, it's just, hey, I need to find a creative way to open it, hmm. let me see, There's some stuff here that we can use. I have an idea. I have here this flat thing here on my keychain. It's from Utah. One time my parents went to the United States and they gave me a keychain from the United States. But today it's gonna be useful because I just have a brilliant plan. I'm gonna use it to have some leverage. Ah. Hmm. Let me see. This is gonna work, guys. This is going to work at some point, believe me or not. Ah. Damn. Yeah, I did it. I opened it. Woo! All right, people, let's uh, inspect our first beer because it's, uh, it's something unusual. All right, people, let's try our first beer. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Poyala? Poyala? Whatever. This is beer from Estonia and it is made with Himalayan rock salt. Apparently, citrus, 
and orange and coriander. Yeah, that's not a combination I ever seen before. Why not? Damn. This is what happens if Bart Coppens takes a shower. The fuck is wrong with the shower? I swear. I didn't do it. It's broken. Alright people, this is the point where Bart Coppens is really gonna get drunk. Here we have what's called a Trappistus. Hmm, let's see what makes this one special. Oof! 9.2% alcohol. That's a lot for a for a wussy like me. From the 13th century, a bunch of monks in a monastery decided to brew beer. It became pretty, pretty popular and it persisted for a few centuries. So we have the Belgian Trappistus. We're gonna see what it's like. Oh no, this is the part that I hate. This is the part that's difficult, man. How? This is just impossible, man. How? Oh my god. Impossible. Uh, god. This is annoying. How do people do this without an opener? Oh wait, they probably don't. They probably have an opener. Oh. I did it! I somehow removed the cap. I should have expected that. I should have expected that. You know what sucks? When people inbox you like on Instagram or WhatsApp and they're like, wow Bart, I'm also a content creator now. I did one live stream on Twitch. One live stream on Twitch. You insignificant little pest. You have no idea what it's like. Sorry, it's beer talk, guys. It's, it's, I'm rambling. Mm. Strong flavor, man, but um, not bad. Not bad at all, but a uh, lot of alcohol. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was a pretty good beer. Strong flavor though, overwhelming strong flavor. But you know what, I'm a newbie when it comes to drinking beer. I'm not that much of an alcoholic. That being said, I don't think I'm gonna test any more tonight because I have to go get up really early tomorrow, this, next morning. And uh, I can sit here all night talking about beer, but we came for the butterflies, not for the alcohol. And um, it's important that uh, tomorrow we have a nice nature video. And for that we have to get up early and um, it's hard to get up early if you have too much beer. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> Oops. So, I'm gonna call it a night. Night ladies and gentlemen. Alright, before I sleep, let me show you the view from my hotel. This is a suburban Den Haag. Hey, good night everyone. Did you know my hotel has a bike storage? Yeah, Dutch people are really big when it comes to bicycles. See that? Anyway, that's it for today. I have to wake up really early tomorrow. Let's get some of those beautiful butterflies and insects and nature. Thank you all. And... I have a crazy announcement as I'm preparing for sleep. This video hasn't even started yet. We've done so many things in this video. 
and the video hasn't even started yet. Wow. See, this is the kind of cool stuff that we can do, man. Finally. I'm excited for it, and uh, I'm probably looking like proper night f nightmare fuel right now. <laughs> Give me your children. <sighs> I'm sorry if I have to hurt you. I don't like hurting people, but it feels so good. <laughs> anyway, good stuff, man. This is 10 out of 10 YouTube content. This is what you want. Influencer Bart Coppins. Anyway, I think it's time to say goodnight, man, before I embarrass myself more. Just having a cheerful moment because uh, yeah. this is the kind of stuff that we can do with a proper budget. So, yeah, that's cool, man. Good night. <laughs> Alright, people, since Bart is asleep, let's talk about the species that we're looking for today. In the dunes, there are two species of fritillary that I would love to film. The Queen of Spain fritillary, or Isoria latonia, and the silver washed fritillary, Agrinis papia. The biggest of the two of them is the silver washed fritillary, and this is also the main species that I want to find today, because I've never seen them in the wild in my country. Isoria latonia colonizes open lands of all kinds, as long as the larval host plants are available. It is particularly common in arable areas on limestone or sand. But in the Netherlands, they mainly reside in the dunes. Caterpillars feed on several kinds of violets and pansies. They have several generations a year. In my country they are found on fallow fields and some grasslands on loam and chalk soil. In and around the coastal dunes and in some years also inland. The butterfly is on the wing from end April until end September and peaks in August. A curious fact is that this species in England occurs only as a rare immigrant occasionally establishing transient colonies, whereas in the Dutch coastal dunes it is an omnipresent species. In the maritime climate it is a typical dune species, making use of the variety in microclimate correlated by the warm south and cool north slopes of the dunes to survive the unpredictability of the maritime climate. However, the silver washed fritillary Agrinus papia is the main species that I want to film today. It's always been a dream of mine to see them in the Netherlands, but I never got the opportunity, sadly. But now I've traveled half the country for them, I hope it's finally going to happen. In most of Europe, Agrinus papia inhabits forests of all kinds. But important are denser occurrences of violets and sunny to half-shaded herbaceous flowering plant communities with adequate nectar for the adults. Agrinus papia is often endangered, only slightly and is still present in most forest areas. Nevertheless, the abundances have often declined drastically in recent de decades. Clearings with dozens of butterflies were formerly not uncommon, but now are restricted to only a few habitats. The reason is the darkening of the forests through dense afforestations without clearings, reduction of forest edges to a narrow line, ongoing eutrophication and finally the overgrowing of former open, light riparian forests after rigor, river regulation. Because the larvae always hibernate, 
This species only has one generation a year. In the Netherlands, the best chance of finding them is in the dunes, where they prefer hotter microclimate of my little temperate maritime country climate. The species also has an alternative and rare form that is grey and bluish, named the Vallecina form. Agrinus papia Vallecina is not a subspecies, but simply an alternative color form. However, typically between 5% to 10% of the butterflies assume this form, so I guess you have to be lucky to see it. Good morning folks, are you excited? Because the nature part of this video is about to begin. I have to go to the central station, catch the bus for 5 minutes, then walk for 48 minutes until uh, I found the natural reserve I was looking for in the dunes near the coast. Boys, I'm gonna miss this place after being there for just one night. It's a nice place. Are you ready to see our Dutch ocean, the coast and awesome nature? Fuck yeah, I am. Alright people, we are 30 minutes away from a big nature reserve. Still have to do the last part on foot. Let's uh, go. It's hard to believe we are close to a natural reserve, but we are. Just a very typical Dutch village right now. Walking along the path. Here's a nice little park. And the real video is soon getting started. Don't worry, guys. In the Netherlands, if you are really rich, I suppose you buy a, one of these houses. Am I jealous? The answer is yes. Look at these huge houses here on the brink of a natural reserve. One tip. If any of you ever want a house like this and a garden like this, don't become a YouTuber. It's a very bad choice of career. Let me tell you that. If you want to get rich, that is. Unless you're literally like PewDiePie, then please go on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here it comes. After a whole travel vlog in The Hague, you've seen some of my country, you've seen some of the city, but here it comes. Here comes nature. Here comes the thing that I actually traveled for. Thank you so much guys for giving me a place to sleep. It really makes a difference for my videos. Here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, here it comes. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. Despite that, ladies and gentlemen, today I am in a special place in the Netherlands. I am near the dunes. Now, this place doesn't really look like dunes, but believe me, they are dunes. 
Um, we are a few kilometers away from the ocean, but we are in a part of the dunes where there's still a nice forest and a lot of wind. And a nice natural reserve. Now there are a few special uh, species of insects that I want to show you here today. This place is called Mayendel. Let's get started! Now when people think of the dunes, they usually think of mountains of sand. That's not entirely true. Of course, the closer we get to the ocean, the less vegetation we are about to see. However, I assure you that dunes is more than just sand. It supports a lot of life, a lot of vegetation, a lot of butterflies, insects, wildlife. And uh, just take a look here, see? Nice landscape, a lot of oak trees, but also other special plants that are typically associated with these sandy soils. And uh, fresh water does permeate here in the ground, so uh, it supports life. Now people, the undergrowth in these uh, sandy soil areas in the dunes, the undergrowth typically consists of this, tall grasses. As you can see, grasses are plentiful here. Just let me turn the camera and you'll see that the whole under understory of the forest, the undergrowth is all grass. See that? So much grass. And these are special types of grasses. A lot of them are from the family of the Poaceae family. Now if you believe it or not, but even uh, plants like corn, even plants like bamboo, even plants like reeds are all part of this uh, family of grasses. But more importantly, there are many butterflies in my country who will lay eggs in them and the caterpillars will feed on the grasses. And in this area, of course, all these grass feeding species are thriving. Let me show you some of these grass feeding butterflies. This is Pironia titonis, also known as the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is a beautiful and underrated species associated with areas that are rich in grasses. As indicated by its common name, the gatekeeper butterfly prefers the habitat of meadow margins and hedges. Field gates are often in such locations. The caterpillars feed on meadow grass, sheep's fescue and many more grasses from the Poaceae family. Weather has been found to have a significant influence on the population size. Warm and dry summers tend to result in the biggest increase in gatekeeper population. One generation of gatekeeper butterflies occurs each year, with adults emerging in July and peaking in early August, and only a few adults remain at the end of the month. The caterpillars of this species hibernate, after females scatter eggs in the grass. After eating from the grasses, Caterpillars will hide in the vegetation from October until the next spring. When they wake up next year, they start eating grass once again and pupate around late June. Butterflies are visible from July to August.
And here we see the speckled wood. Yes, their caterpillars also feed on grasses. This species is very common in my country in woodlands, forests, dunes, parks, or anywhere with grasses, shade and some sunspots. You will see this species many times in my outdoor videos. And here we have a meadow brown, Maliola yurtina. These butterflies lay eggs on blades of grasses and the caterpillars feed on the grass and then hibernate. They too have one generation a year, just like the gatekeeper, and it's always nice to see these. Proof how important grass is for butterflies. Ooh, now this I like. So I found a small area with lots of purple flowers. It's a mix of several species of flowers, but it's attracting many hungry butterflies in the morning. Let's have a look people, this is perfect. Now in my country this butterfly species is not particularly rare. I go as far as to say that it's somewhat common. But in the part of the country where I live, where my house uh, resides, I never see them. So in my case this butterfly species is worth traveling for to observe them. Because uh, near my house where I live, this species, the, you know, I have 0% chance of seeing them. There are some parts of the Netherlands I've never visited before. The Netherlands is a small country, but despite that I haven't seen all of it. And uh, the dunes and stuff is a place that I rarely visit, because it's kind of far away-ish from my home. And uh, yeah, as you can see it has different species that you usually see in my outdoor videos. And today a female brimstone butterfly is making a guest appearance. Easy to recognize because the females are white and the males are bright yellow. This is a really cool species. It's one of my favorite uh, period whoop, butterflies in my country. Seems that a fly also wanted some nectar. But they didn't decide to share the flower after all. The brimstone butterfly in my country is, um, is really common this year. I've seen many specimens, so I suppose the conditions for them are just right. And I have no doubt that we're going to see some males too today. Well, there she goes. Yep, here we have a male. Uh, here we had a male, sorry. Damn. Oh, he's uh, there. Let's see if he wants to stay still. Well, so yeah, as I said, the males of this species are uh, bright yellow. Especially the upper side of their wings is bright yellow. They kind of look like a lemon when they fly, lemon colored. Let's see if we can get some footage when it uh, decides to flutter around a little. Then you'll see the bright yellow in, on the top of its wings. Here we see a male and a female in the same shot. See the color difference? They don't seem to be interested in each other, they just seem to be interested in food. This uh, is a male resting in the vegetation. While here close to the male, there is a female on the flower. And another male passing by. So, oh, we have three brimstones in one shot. See that? Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, it's a good year for them. The sun has just barely started to come up. I'm early because I finally had a place to sleep. Normally I have to miss the mornings in my videos because of my travel time. But today I don't and I'm very happy and very thankful for this. Because it's my fans who arranged it. Anyway, I barely started the video and already it's looking very promising when it comes to butterflies. This is gonna be a good day I hope.
All right, let's proceed. Let's proceed. Now ladies and gentlemen, this is an impressive plant. Look at how big it is and how cool the flowers are. This one is called Verbuscum Tapsus or Great Mulian. And you'll typically only see them in um, areas where the soils are very rocky and or stony. They love these dry, hot microclimates with uh, barren soil. So they thrive here in the dunes. It's a beauty of a plant. Look at how tall. It's taller than me. And that's saying something. It's, help, it's said that they help with resp respiratory issues. I don't know if that's true. It's an urban myth. Big plant, huh? I'm not much of a botanist, but I am increasingly starting to appreciate plants. And every time I go into nature, I want to tell you some facts about the plants as well, if we can. And uh, this is one that we cannot leave out, of course, you, looking at the sheer size. And the, if you're lucky, then they can have a lot of flowers at the same time. Look at all these giant verbascum plants. And the birds seem to be making a huge ruckus today. Can you hear it? That's crazy. Now people here in the dunes, there are two rare species of fritillary. They're known as Agrinis pavia and Isoria latona. Seeing them is one thing, but filming them is another. These butterflies are notoriously difficult to get a close-up of because they are very nimble flyers and rarely ever pass in order to take a rest. If you're really lucky, you'll see one of them on a flower. Otherwise, they'll just literally fly around all day. I've seen a few of them today, but no close-up yet. The close-up is gonna be the hardest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just beautiful. Look at the amount of wild flowers and stuff here next to the road. You just love to see it. Here we see Lycaena fleas on the floor, a very small and orange butterfly. Now it's late in the sea. Whoop! It just flew away, but that's okay. I still see it fluttering around. Yeah, are you gonna land there for me? Okay, sorry guys, this is awkward. There it is. Thankfully, it just settled somewhere else. Now what I was about to say that it's late in the season, uh, so most of some of these butterflies are old. And this one in particular, it's, it's orange has kind of faded. And um, that's a shame because when these butterflies are fresh and in good condition, they're really extremely bright orange, like almost iridescent shiny orange. Whoa. But this is a very pale, uh, what I assume, old butterfly. But that's fine, you know, they're animals, they're not objects from factories. And we have to accept the fact that in nature sometimes you'll see animals that are not in perfect condition, or their colors have faded. And you know what, it's interesting as well, if you think about it. Well, it's a really tiny butterfly. I'm not sure if this species is already on their last generation in my country. But currently it's already August and uh, typically many species in my country in August are on their last generation. Before hibernating. So, after August comes September and September is still a warm month. But in October things start to cool down and then this one, that's when it will slowly... You will have to transition to autumn soon. Kind of makes me sad, I hate autumn. 
thankfully I have like two months of summer left, but I don't like all these seasons in the Netherlands, man. I am made for heat and sunlight. And here we see a female of the Icarus blue or the common blue, scientific name Poliomatus Icarus. Now some of you guys may be commenting and saying, oh I, I lost sight of it, where the hell are you? Oh god. Yeah, let me finish my sentence. Some of you guys may be saying, well, what the heck Bart, that thing didn't look blue in the slightest. Uh, I agree, it refers to the males, and the males of that species are very bright blue. Super common butterfly, so it's nice to see, but uh, hoping to see more. Let me tell you something about the drinking water in the Netherlands. The drinking water, like the tub water that comes out of the shower and the tap, is the same quality as mineral water that you buy from bottles in the supermarket. We don't add any chlorine to it or any other substances. How is that possible? That's because my country has a very unique system to filter water. And that's a system of filtration. Do you guys see these green objects here in the background? These green, uh, I don't know, let me stand behind the camera. So we're going to show you a close-up of them. Oops. See these things? Let me tell you what this is. This is very important, by the way. If you want to learn something about the Netherlands, this is cool. So what we do in the Netherlands is uh, we, we filter water by pumping it through the dunes. And the sand in the dunes will filter the water naturally. Now some of you guys may think, wow, that's weird. Uh, but believe me, this system of filtration completely purifies the water. As you guys will know that uh, at a certain level in the, in the, in the ground, there's a certain level where it's like the, um, the underground water, right? And this uh, water is very clean because it permeates through many layers of sand. And um, the end result is something very drinkable. So in these dunes, you can see here these, uh, these wells. I don't know what these wells are used for, but it has to do with our tap water, our drinking water, that's being filtered here in the ground. We don't have to add anything like fluoride or chlorine, it's completely clean. And as far as I know, only my country has this system. Maybe there's other countries too, but uh, I just thought it was interesting. Look at all these giant verbascum plants. And the birds seem to be making a huge ruckus today. Can you hear it? That's crazy. Guys, I'm very, very nervous. I just spotted one of the butterflies that I traveled the whole country for. And it's so fast and impossible to film. I'm really nervous about having a close-up because I traveled for a whole day and a night to see this butterfly. So I need to have my close-up. So, right now I see an extremely rare butterfly and the butterfly that I visited this area for, the Agrinis pavia. But it rarely ever sits still. Do you see it? Oh my god. Please, I want to have a close-up so bad. Oh my god, I got it. I have it, a close-up of this species. Okay, it's not sitting in a perfect place because the shade is blocking it. But you can't have everything now, can you? <gasps> this is it, guys. Agrinis pavia. This is it, guys. So in my country, this uh, butterfly is absolutely a rarity. 
It's not something that you'll very commonly see ever, except here in the dunes around Mayendel. And I'm very happy to have my clothes up. This is literally what I came for. I'm very happy and satisfied right now. Oh yeah. As I was making the close-up of the incredibly rare butterfly, I just saw something really rare in the vegetation and I can't stop smiling. This is a dream. I just saw a few specimens of the European tree frog, Hila arborea. Yes, my country has tree frogs, but they're an incredibly rare and threatened species in my country. I go into nature a lot, as you can see in my videos. But um, I've seen this in my country less than 10 times in my life. But it turns out that here in the reeds, there are a few tree frogs. And it was because of the butterfly that I saw them, because it landed in the reeds. So I went there to film the butterfly and I saw the tree frogs. Let me show you. Ladies and gentlemen, today I present you something extraordinary that we rarely see. This is the European tree frog, Hila arborea. Yes, believe it or not, my country has one rare species of tree frog. Now, I lived in the Netherlands for about 28 years of my life. And I've only seen a handful of these creatures before, but in this area they seem common. This is a treat. This is incredible. Tree frogs in the Netherlands. Who would have thought? Wow! I've been trying to capture these creatures on camera for ages. But this natural reserve has it all. I love you, Mayendel. It was totally worth it to travel here. Meet Hila arborea, the European tree frog. In my country, it's considered to be a rare species. So I'm very happy to capture them on camera for you right now. Unlike other species of frogs, the European tree frog can tolerate some periods of dryness very well. Where other frogs would shrivel up like a raisin, tree frogs can bask in the sun without quickly dehydrating. Therefore, they can be found in dry habitats like the dunes. They do breed in water, however, and tend to climb in the vegetation near open sources of water. You can see them in marshlands, damp meadows, reed beds, stream banks, lake shores, but also the dunes and more. European tree frogs reproduce in stagnant bodies of water, such as lakes, ponds, swamps, reservoirs, and sometimes even in puddles. They are able to live up to 15 years. Some of the main threats to European tree frogs include habitat fragmentation and destruction, pollution of wetlands, predation from fish, capture for the pet trade, and climate change. Fish have been observed preying on European tree frogs, and in Europe, fish introduced into ponds results in a significant decline of their population. In my country, the Netherlands, since the last century, this species has suffered a devastating 80% decline. The future of this species in my country is sadly not very certain. The good news is though, since recently their populations are finally increasing again due to strict conservation measures. So there is hope.
Seeing tree frogs in the wild and filming them for my channel has always been a dream of mine. But it was never possible because I live in the wrong part of the country. But today, my viewers made it happen. Thank you guys. See, this is the cool kind of stuff I can film if I'm allowed to travel for my videos. It is worth it. I'm not bluffing. It is worth it. Ow, I'm being bitten by a fly. You know, my country even has stuff like snakes, seals, eagles. I can film them all, but they are too far away from my home to do it casually. Oh my god, here is another one. Seems to be missing a large chunk of its wings, however. But do we care? Nah. This is the rarity we came for, and not only do I have one, but two close-ups right now. I don't care that it's damaged. Like I said, it's late in the year, it's August, so expect many of the butterflies to have damage right now. It's currently at the end of many of their generations. Uh, so yeah. Wow. Here's another one and just like the previous one, this one is an incredible veteran. Just look at the huge parts, chunks of his wing missing. To me it's pretty clear that these butterflies are under constant attack of birds. Yeah, that's definitely bird attack damage. Wow. Maybe with some luck we can see a specimen that's fresh. I mean, we can't complain about a little bit of damage, because traveling here and actually finding several of these rarities in one video, what are the chances? So, complaining that they are not in perfect condition, that's just being spoiled at this point. Then again, it would be nice. If these butterflies are fresh, they have a very powerful orange bright color. Damn. Let me tell you about them. I'm gonna be honest, I have no reason to complain. I've seen a crazy amount of butterflies, including the species I wanted to find here that are kind of rare. And even rare tree frogs. But I'm kind of hoping that we're going to see a specimen that's undamaged. That would be even better. Let's see if it happens. Of course, the peacock butterfly is here too. It's a beautiful species, but uh, I see them almost every day. Not saying that they're boring, but uh, you know, it's the exposure effect. If you see something every day, you start. You, you, sometimes you stop being so excited. I'm more excited over the fritillaries that we saw today than the peacock. But I guess for the people watching this right now in the United States and other countries, you don't have this species and to you it is probably very exciting to see this one. To be honest, like in its superficial appearance, it is objectively one of the prettiest species of my country. 
I mean the fritillaries are the real rarity in this video, but um, the peacock is probably more beautiful. This creature here right here is a hawk moth. A hummingbird hawk moth. Can you see it? Wow, another rarity. This is the grayling Hipparchia semele. And the caterpillars feed on grasses as well. It is rare in my country. It is a treat to see it today. I have no words. Today is just rarity after rarity after rarity. And I have these flowers to thank for it as well. It seems like the butterfly gods are answering all my questions. All my uh, prayers today. I should tell you guys something about these flowers because they deserve it at this point. Almost all the rare butterflies that we saw today were on this flower. And this one is called Hemp Agrimoni or Eupatorium Carnabinum. Now this plant is a notoriously good flower for pollinators, in particular butterflies. And the proof is in the pudding, because the fritillaries were on this flower and uh, the other rare butterfly was also on this flower. So is the majority of the butterflies we saw in this video. It's a native flower too. If you live in Europe and you want to attract butterflies to your garden and help them and attract pollinators, then plant this flower. It's a native plant. And it's amazing for insects, it really helps them and it will attract them to your garden. In the dunes there is also a tourist center, where people can enjoy food in a restaurant. I usually avoid tourist hotspots, but I went to check it out. Turns out it is a farm, and the farm has a public toilets, tourist information and a place to order food. Told you guys the water here from the ground is drinkable. Here you can tap it. A lot of people were photographing butterflies on the flowers. As turns out they contained a lot of fritillaries. Oh my god. Can you believe it? All day I have hiked through the dunes only to find most of these butterflies in the tourist center. The butterfly bushes were swarming with silver washed fritillaries. Jackpot! Agrinis papia is the biggest species of fritillary in the Netherlands. 
A species that is sadly struggling. Sadly, this species has declined so much in my country, it even completely disappeared from the Netherlands for a long time. But only recently, a few new colonies have formed. To blame for their decline are many factors, but the major ones are agriculture, but also improper forest management. Important for this species is the presence of its host plant or violets and pansies, but also a variety of flowering herbs that provide them plenty of nectar. Both of these, the violets and the nectar plants, tend to grow in open clearings in the forest. But due to improper forest management, many of the forests in the Netherlands became high-density forests with little open spaces in them, that the veterinary needs to survive. I don't believe it. I walked like 10 kilometers to get a close-up of these freaking butterflies. Oh my god. And they're at the freaking tourist center. I'm done, people. I'm done. Look. Look at that. Here's literally the restaurant where people are eating. It's freaking insane. If I knew this, I just had to go here. I skipped all the walking, maybe. This is bizarre. I've been walking for miles and miles and miles in the dunes to see these butterflies. Turns out there's more of them in the tourist centrum than in the natural reserve. This isn't even a native plant. This is literally here's where the restaurant is, where the tourists come to uh, have dinner and they planted flowers here. And I see more fritillaries here than I've seen all day in the natural reserve. It's crazy how that... I, I'm not complaining, but it's just... You don't expect it. In 1980, the species completely disappeared from the Netherlands and was not seen again until an established new small colony was found around the year 2005. And since then, they have been consistently breeding again and increasing in numbers. But they are still a little bit vulnerable. Thankfully, this species has the ability to migrate long distances and is a strong flyer. Unlike other species of fritillaries, which enables it to cross a lot of unsuitable habitat to finally find a suitable habitat which I suppose makes them less vulnerable to habitat fragmentation than most other fritillaries. Here we see Aglaes urticae, the small tortoise shell butterfly. This used to be one of the most common butterfly species in my country, but uh, they've been uh, doing pretty badly for the recent years. I'm sad to say this is the first, uh, oh no, it's actually the second small tortoise shell that I've seen all year. Like five to ten years ago, this used to be one of the most common species in our country. But um, I guess the population has declined. I hope that they make a comeback in the future. For the decline of the large tortoise shell, the spread of a particular species of parasitic fly has been blamed. But um, I can't say anything conclusive about it yet, because I haven't had a look at the data. I don't know if it's true, there's probably more factors contributing to the decline of a species than just blaming one species of native parasite. 
but uh, maybe I'll make a video about it later if I read a little bit more about the subject. I don't want to blur out random theories. Here we see a cat destroying native wildlife. Doesn't matter that there's rare butterflies here and rare tree frogs and rare birds. Let's release a, a cat, one of the worst invasive species. Looks like it just killed something. Cats shouldn't be allowed outdoors, by the way. They're a disaster for the environment. Even crazier is that there's also tree frogs in here. Can you see it? He's very well camouflaged. I'll put a circle around him. See that? In this area the tree frogs are common. And they're... Oops. They're also in the butterfly bush. See the tree frog? It's hard to see. They're absolutely swarming here. Like swarming. I've seen over, definitely over 20 butterflies. Over 20 fritillaries already. Oh, look people. There's a predator. Don't know if you can see it. But a, Euro a European hornet here is on the hunt. Can you see it? It's very hard to follow because he's very fast. Now, this one is not interested in nectar. It's interested in grabbing the butterflies. Literally, that's what they hunt. See it? See? It just tried to grab a butterfly. The good news is that despite the fact the species is struggling and declining in most of Northern Europe, they are still very common in Central and Southern Europe and are not declining as strongly as the Northern populations are. The reason I am trying to grow my channel is this. I am more or less the only person right now on YouTube with a bigger channel dedicated to spreading awareness about the conservation status of butterflies and moths. If my channel ever grows really big, I promise to use my money and power for species conservation and protection purposes. Sorry for filming these so much, but this is literally the butterfly I traveled uh, the whole country for, so when I see them, you be sure as hell that I'm gonna film them as much as I can. But there, there are so many of them, I'm gonna have to stop filming them at some point. Because, uh, wow, how many minutes of footage can I add? All right, guys, this is the last few minutes of footage. It's hard to leave a place like this behind and stop filming. What? There's two of them pairing. Here on the flower in the back. These two are pairing, can you see that? They're attached together. Don't know if you can see it. Sorry for the shaky footage. Some funky stuff is going on here. man this kind of stuff is why I should travel more to make videos I swear there are so many parts of my country in the Netherlands that I'm never able to film for YouTube because it's too far away from my home but it's not today with pain in my heart I announced that uh, I think now is the time to leave this butterfly bush behind as many species as there are on it, it's spectacular. I am enjoying it. This is probably the best, best day of my whole year. It's incredible. Wow, I didn't even know my country could have this diversity of butterflies. Wow. Just look at that. But, ah, oh, look, a fritillary. The thing is though that I have more to do today than just stare at butterflies as much as I would like to. 
day. This is a perfect specimen. So I'm about to uh, make preparations and walk away because I still have a long journey ahead of me. And if I'm gonna stand here and stare at butterflies, um, that's, that can be compromised. So, and with that in mind, I say adios, amigos. I feel like a child whose parents told me it's time to go home after going to McDonald's. That hurts to leave behind. It really, really hurts to leave that bush full of fritillaries behind, but... You know, I have to go home at some point. At some point, too. But uh, I, I think we had our fill of fritillaries today. <laughs> starting to smell the ocean now. We must be really close, let's go. There we go, people. There it is. The ocean. We made it! We made it to the ocean! If you're wondering what our final destination is, it's here! This is the skyline of the city of Scheveningen. And that's where I'm going. But looks are the saving, it's still uh, one hour away. <coughs> I still have to do a lot of walking to reach it. See, far away. Better get started then. Aha! This should be a barrel jellyfish. Rhizostoma pulmo. Let me wait for the ocean to work. I'm not sure if these can sting. I'm not a jellyfish expert. But uh, I do... Oh! Uh-oh! I'm not taking any chances. Don't mess with jellyfishes you can't identify. These things are really evil.
In Dutch we call them razors for obvious reasons. They're very sharp and you can hurt your feet on them if you're running around. Funny, eh? The Dutch name for it is Scheermes, it means razor. See? It kind of makes sense. Yikes. That's a big barrel jellyfish. Yeah. Do these guys stink? I don't know. I'm not sure, so uh, let's not find out. I'm curious though. Told ya. Still have a long way to go. We can see the skyline, but the looks are deceiving. I think I'm gonna take a look in the dunes later too. Just some exploring before I go back to the city. Are there people watching this who are into gulls? I don't know anything about gulls. But you know what? I'm a guy who appreciates moths myself. So I'm pretty sure that somewhere in the world there's a few gull specialists. And maybe one of them happens to be watching this and they're like, oh wow, real seagulls from the Netherlands. I don't know the name of the species. Uh, I really don't know. But I can tell you that they are pretty rude. And in the coastal city of Scheveningen they even steal people's food sometimes. Alright people, I'm going back into the dunes for a short amount of time because it's more fun than just walking on the beach. Maybe we'll see a little bit of nature then before I finally reach the city. These are Nazi bunkers from the Second World War. They were built to protect the then Nazi occupied Netherlands from Allied invasions. Relics of the past. They were never used in combat though, as far as I know, because the actual Allied invasion happened in Normandy. Still, some bonus cultural history for you. And here is the great water tower of the dunes, in which much of the filtered and purified water is stored. It is also a national monument, since it was built as early as 1874, and is thus much older than a century. The drinking water in Amsterdam, The Hague and large parts of North and South Holland is cleaned and filtered in the sand dunes along the Dutch coast with the North Sea. The Mayendel Dune Reserve is under management of a water company called Dunia. It is here that they process their water. And yet, most of the 2000 hectares of dune landscape is open to the public. Yes, it's true. This nature reserve is managed by a water company. I feel like I should have told you this fact earlier into the video. Drinking water in the Netherlands must pass 700 tests to ensure quality. In comparison, the drinking water that is in bottled water only has to pass about 20 tests. So it's true, ladies and gentlemen, Dutch people 
shower and flush their toilets with water that is the same quality of the expensive mineral water that people buy in bottles in other countries. And we don't use any chemicals to clean our water at all. It is all natural and filtered by the dunes. Am I a nationalist? No. Am I happy to live in a country with the world's best drinking water? Yes. In some countries you actually have to go to the supermarket to buy drinkable water. That's unthinkable in the Netherlands. The drinking water that we get from our tap and our shower is so good you could use it for an aquarium. Like to keep fish in. We don't add anything to it. I worked in countries like uh, Laos, Cambodia, but even some places in southern Europe where they add chlorine to the water. And uh, that's not necessary in our country. I say that's one of the benefits of living here for sure. Elema griseola, the dingy footman, is a common species of tiger moth in the dunes. Its caterpillars feed on several types of lichen. The moths can be seen from July to August, found around damp woodlands, fans and sea cliffs. Wow, after how many hours? Seven hours of straight walking, we came to an end. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is how we do an outdoor video. Ha. Wait, is it closed? Oh, it's not closed. Good. And it's official. We're heading into the city now. There's no turning back. Who needs Miami Beach if you have Scheveningen? This is one of the most popular tourist places next to our beaches and ocean where many people come visit the pier and the boulevard and the ocean. I'd love to show you more of this, but honestly I am exhausted and I don't have the energy anymore today. But who knows, with the support of my viewers we can make more of these videos in the future. They are expensive to make though. I am too tired to show you more of this city. I walked for like 7 hours. Maybe in the future we will have the budget for more fun videos. But that just doesn't depend on me, but also on my viewers.
Sorry guys, I'm going home. I'm too tired to show you more. Finally, we are back home, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a broken man. I walked 20 kilometers through the dunes, which is... Walking through sand is not hard with so much gear. There you go. Traveled half the country for two days non-stop. Be walking for seven hours since I woke up. Oh, I'm a broken man. But man, it was fun. We've seen so much stuff. We've seen so much crazy stuff, people. Oof. Oh, I need a shower and I need a nap. Anyway, there's one thing I want to say, people. If my YouTube channel was monetized, I would do videos like this more often and travel the country to show you awesome species and awesome places. But I can't because this channel is demonetized. That means when I upload a video, I don't make one single dollar from it. Nothing. My YouTube channel is not supported by YouTube. It's completely demonetized. I don't gain anything from uploading it from YouTube themselves. Instead, I have crowdfunding. When people like my videos and when people like the show that they are watching, sometimes they tip me a dollar or several dollars and it's kind of like tipping a waiter, if you like the service, I guess, or a guy who's making music on the street and some people, they like the music and they give him some coins. That's how it works for me. This content is crowdfunded. And we also have to thank somebody, and I think we all know who. His name is Rob. Rob is um, my fan from the United States. To the Rob, the myth, the man, the, man, the legend. It's um, for this video. It was actually Rob who paid for uh, the cost of my hotel, and that's why I was able to do it. Usually I don't have the budget to travel half the country just to make one YouTube video. Especially because my YouTube channel is demonetized and I don't make money from it. Making so many expenses for a vlog for me is financially not sustainable. So thank you Rob. It's because of you that this video is here today. Really. You really made a difference and I hope that everybody enjoyed this special video. It was paid for me by a fan. It is a, it's a giant honor, to be honest. I never imagined people would like my videos so much. They even uh, help compensate me for my travel cost. My country, the Netherlands, has a lot of things to offer. There's many parts of my country I never even visited because it's too far away. And I have no business going there just to make one video. So it feels good to finally have the budget. Anyway, what I want to say is that you can make a difference. Um, let me just... I just found a moth that has escaped in my room. I need to uh, put him away. Anyway. Anyway. If you like the content, if you like the show, if you like my videos, Please consider tipping or donating or becoming my patron on the platform patreon.com. You can also send money through PayPal, through Ko-Fi. I am asking, not demanding. Of course, you're no less of a viewer if you do not donate. I appreciate everybody who watches my videos, who shares them, who comments. Those things help me a lot as well. But if you want to see more of this stuff, then the crowdfunding really helps. Because the, bu the budget uh, that I get from basically the kindness of strangers on the internet is what determines how much I can do and how crazy I can go for this channel. And if I have a lot of budget, 
I can make crazy videos and go over the top, like I did today. That's why this video was special, because a fan helped me with the budget. Anyway, that was the message for today. Guys, hope to see you in my next upload. And uh, oof, I gotta calm down. Cheers! The hotel was paid for by my fan Rob, but the train tickets were paid for by my patrons on the crowdfunding website Patreon that helps support my content. Therefore I will also play the credits today. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, it is crucial that you consider supporting it financially. This is a 100% crowdfunded channel because it is demonetized by YouTube.